So I hope I've given you some things to think about. Uh, you've given me some things to think about. I am only here as the opening act for my lovely friend Susan Gerbic. She does the real magic. And if you know about the stings that we've been doing, there's one that's uh, in the New York Times we made. She's a worker. And uh, let's bring her on with a round of applause. No more introductions. I was too busy over there playing Cranky Uncle in my phone ball, which is a really great way. Okay, so let's pull this up. So, I think it could work. Let's see. Thank you guys for showing up. Isn't Janine amazing? I tell you what, she, she is just a leader and driver in there, and uh, we need people to come and help out and, and, um, and learn from her so we can get uh, uh, our community more more active. Is that the remote that I'm using? No, that's I think stuff. you need to page down, do the Sorry. arrow up and down. Do you want this one? Yeah, that'd be great. Good, yeah. Let's Can I put on? Yeah. I'm trading. Okay, let me put this on my belt. This way I can talk with my hands. Is that okay? Yes. All right. So I will speak in hand sign language too. No, I don't. Thank you guys all for coming out. This is fantastic. Mark and I are over here. And uh, what I'm going to talk about today is activism. How to make, how to actually have purpose and do stuff with a lot of the skills that we've learned. Um, I started out pretty much in the skeptic toolbox, as I mentioned earlier. Ray Hyman was such a wonderful friend of ours. Uh, when you came to these toolboxes, you, you felt like you were with family. You really got to interact with people. It was a great feeling of community. And I hope that we can reciprocate that and keep it going somehow as well. So I really appreciate you guys coming out. And Ray was, I was just a person sat in the audience, didn't know anybody, didn't do anything. And Ray, one day, was like, Susan, why don't you do stuff like this in Monterey? Where I'm at. Why don't you do this? And I had, I, I was like, I don't even have a BA. I'm, I'm nobody, you know. And he's like, of course you can. And he's so inspiring. So we love you, Rick. Just absolutely adore you. Uh, we are all children of Ray Hyman in a lot of ways. So, okay, so I'm going to talk about some of the things that I did. And when I say I, I actually mean people around me. I don't do all of this myself. I'm a planner, I'm a manager. Um, I was a baby photographer for 34 years at JCPenney, so I know how to herd cats, okay? Because taking pictures of little children, at least 20 shots, all different, within 10 minutes, let me tell you, that is, and three outfits, uh, it, is, it is work and it is fast, and you have got to be on it. So I, my skills are uh, not in science, as uh, many of you know. My skills are in people management and planning and, and all that kind of fun stuff. But I do I now have a BA, but I've never used it for anything. So, social and behavioral sciences. So I'm going to talk about two main things. All of this is mainly what I did during the pandemic. Keeping in mind when I say I, I actually mean lots of people in my group. So this is our project. We are a nonprofit. A pro, we are a nonprofit, the about time project.org. I'll mention it several times so that you guys can take pictures of the screen so you can go to look it up. We are 501c3, whatever. All right, so I'm going to start off today talking about real skeptics, which is my shirt that I've got on here. This is the, uh, the, the arm of the About Time Project that focuses on psychics. So we spend a lot of time on these people we call, Mark uh, learned to call, uh, he started the trick of calling them grief vampires because they feed off of the grief the desperation of people. So everything I'm going to talk about today, and I'll go through this fairly quickly, hopefully we'll have some Q&A time, because I will talk about um, mainly what we did this last two and a half years from our computers, without having to go and attend anything or anything of the sort. Uh, we did the New York, there was an uh, important article in the New York Times and it was over two stings I did in 2017, 2018. They were called Operation Pizza Roll and Operation Peach Pit. And so this is since then. 
So these are articles I write for, I publish for Skeptical Inquirer. I hope you guys are all subscribers, and you can also find these articles online at skepticalinquirer.org. And some of the things we did, the first thing we did, and don't read all this, because I know we're going to sit here and try to read these things. It's a little faint in here. You can't really read all that print. All of these articles are available on my website, which was abouttimeproject.org. And you can also find me as an author on Skeptical Inquirer. I've got 150 articles or some crazy amount like that. The first thing we did, and I think this is really a lot of fun, is that we went to, um, um, I went to all the websites for all the psychics we could find. Oh, no, that's not it. That's the next slide. This was, how could a psychic have known? Mark Edward and I hear this all the time. There's no way the psychic could have known. I'm not on Facebook. I'm not on social media. My, they told me all about my dad who died before Facebook. There's no way anybody could have possibly known. They knew my father's name. They knew my uncle's name. I'm telling you, there is a way they could know, and there's probably multiple ways they can know. So in the article I wrote, I talk about some of the many ways they can know. And if you specifically, you person right there, they can't find any information about, they're on to somebody else. So, you know, it's, they don't have to know every single one of you. They only need to know enough about so, a, a set amount of people, right? They don't have to have every person. But I was, this article here talks about all the ways they could know. And I put up some actual photographs from Facebook of my house. And one of the things we don't realize is that there's so many clues in the background of a person's picture. And you know, a lot of us are on Zoom right now. You can tell a lot about the books on the shelves behind them. You can see their photographs on the shelves behind them. You can see children in them or, or activities or skiing or whatever. There's a lot that tells you about a person from an actual photograph and what's happening in, behind them. So these are some pictures, like I was doing a puzzle, there's you know things on my uh, kitchen window, there's my cat, you know, what book am I reading, and so on. So a psychic can tell, cold reading, looking at you in person or through a Zoom screen, they're making certain distinctions about you, your face, your, your age, presumed age. Um, you know, what is your jewelry you're wearing? Is it a wedding ring, no wedding ring, a college ring? What, what is it? They can see you, they can hear your accent, just lots of things they can get from just a face-to-face -face thing. So that's more or less cold reading <clears throat> to some extent. I'm not going to get into the details too much because we are a group of skeptics, you guys probably know. But my expertise is in hot reading, which is when the psychic or creep down card knows about you from doing research on you. There's no way that you can hot read and not know you are conning, you are being a, a, a charlatan because you have to purposely go to the trouble to find out the information on the person. So that's one article I wrote during the pandemic. This one over here is abysmal failure, a skeptical uh, psychic medium attempts to read Susan Gerber. So a woman reached out to me on, on uh, email and she said, you know Susan, I read your New York Times article and if you had a reading from a real psychic, you would turn in your psychic, you know, card, I mean your skeptic card. I'm like, oh, is that right? But she says, I'm an evidential medium, which is a term that they use a lot. They use evidence. And by evidence means that they do a reading with somebody and then the person says, yeah, that's right. And they say, there's evidence. So that's an evidential <laughs> medium. So, so this woman, I, she said, I'll give you a free reading. I said, I'll do it if I can do it live on Facebook. Because I don't want you to accuse me later of editing it down to taking out the hits and the misses and, you know, I make you look bad because you failed. And she says, okay. But she didn't want to be on Facebook. She says, I don't use any of that stuff. I said, okay, great. I'll put it on speakerphone. So I dialed her phone number, pointed the Zoom camera at me, and I just put it on speakerphone. And her and I did a, a reading over uh, you know, the phone. And I'm there. I thought it was going to be 30 minutes, and it was like two hours. And I had people sit there for two hours and watch the whole thing. I know Leonard was there. Leonard, I saw you were there. So, he left the room, of course. Leonard, we're talking about you. So, uh, there he comes, ready. <laughs> so, he was there. And so, people stayed and they sat there for a couple hours watching this. And then they came after she left and she abysmally failed. 
they came onto the Zoom screen and we talked about it. And it was so interesting because different people heard different things about what she said. And people, and the way the woman worded, she was not a hot reader, she was a cold reader. But you could tell the way she said things and the way they were, that we interpret them, it was, it was really brilliant to just listen to the, to the thought process of this person trying to make hits. And I didn't respond. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Oh, well, that's interesting too. That's interesting too. She hit nothing. She had me reading with my grandfather, who was, him and I were sharing popcorn, a uh, bowl of popcorn, and another grandfather. We were watching TV together. I've never known my grandparents. They were, one died in 1930, one died in 1960, never met any of them. So she had me like having relationships with them. So anyway, those are those two articles. Here's one I started talking about. So I went to all the websites for all the main psychics, the Greek vampires that are known, you know, like have a television show or have like some sort of media presence of some kind. I went through all of them, New Zealand, Australia, UK, everything, and I did screenshots of all their uh, events, and uh, we went through their social media. What we were doing is trying to look and see if anybody predicted COVID, lockdowns or anything. And we made screenshots and made archives of everything because we didn't want them to be able to come back later and say that they, you know, oh yeah, I did. Not a single one did. So we've got the good, I have an article, it's, it's published with all the screenshots in it. It's basically saying not a single one ever even slightly predicted it. In fact, what a lot of them did is they they put together their, their events, just like normal, like they all do. John Edward was going to go to Australia, Teresa Caputo was going to be in Reno, all that, and then they had to cancel them. Now, why would a psychic have to cancel their events? Couldn't you know that we were going to have this two, three year pandemic where everything was shut down, where people were masked? where we would know the name of the post office, post office director to Joy for some strange reason. Why would we know that? Why would that be common knowledge? Why would this happen? Why didn't anyone predict it? And if they can't predict that kind of stuff, what good are they, right? I mean, if they're out there telling me Grandma wore a hat and she had roses, well, oh, congratulations, so than almost everybody else's grandmother. But a pandemic? No, you nothing, you got nothing on that? But yet they're still on TV, yet they're still out there. So people want to believe, and it is not their fault. A lot of these people are out and they buy into it because they're lonely, they're desperate. They don't know any better. And to be frank with you, a lot of people come from a world of religion where you're gonna go on to another life. So it's not that hard to believe that somebody could be in contact with them, right? If you believe you're going to live another life, then why is it so hard to believe that maybe, just maybe, there's somebody out there in contact with them? It's not their fault. They are not to be the ones that we, we, uh, we make light of. It is the purposeful actions by these people, these Greek vampires. So another thing that we did is I had a series of investigations. We're all locked down, so what the heck are we going to do with our time? We went through a lot of old um, uh, investigation. We went through and re-looked at some of the stuff we've done in the past. So Thomas John, who's known as the seatbelt psychic, he's known as the Manhattan medium, he's known as Thomas John Experience. He had a show in Vegas, believe it or not, at Caesars for a while, until it was canceled. He told everybody that he would be there indefinitely. I don't think he made it four months. Um, and so one of the things we looked at during during the, the the COVID rule, we call the series called Operation Lemon Meringue. Mark writes all of our operation names, so if you have a problem with it, talk to Mark. So Operation <laughs> Lemon Meringue, we did several things. One was we noticed that Thomas John, on a Zoom screen, okay, you're on a Zoom screen, we noticed that he would just be talking to the people on the screen, because we could see these things, because you just pay 20 bucks or whatever, and he's sitting there and he's talking to them, and it's kind of random stuff he's talking about, like, you know, it's very stressful. I see that you're really stressed out right now is because it's been very stressful. I mean, he's just not even thinking, like his brain isn't engaged, he's just talking. And then he'll pause, 
and then he'll look at the right hand corner, lower corner of the screen, like a quick look, and then he'll look right at the person in the eyes and he'll say, who's John? And it's always an amazing hit. Like it's dad, grandma, I mean not John, but you know, it's it's somebody specifically in the person and they're like, oh, oh my gosh, that's my brother who just died of, you know, cancer. And he's like, yeah, because that's what he's telling me. So every time we'd see that little look down into the right hand corner of the zoom screen. So we got we got a little like, okay, what what's going on there? And after time, we realized what's in the bottom right-hand corner of a lot of people's computer screens if you're on social media. Anybody have any idea? Facebook. What happens if you're on uh, Facebook and you have Messenger open, right? It appears in the right-hand lower corner of your screen. So what we think is happening, and I don't want to be sued. Well, go ahead. Come on, Thomas John. Um, what we think is going on is that somebody's feeding him this information. And by, and they're just, he's just blah, 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 address, blah, 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 whatever's going on in your life, whatever. And then he's, so a message pops up on Facebook, on Messenger, and it says, who is John? Or John, or something like that. And he just goes, who's John? And the person says, that's my brother. And he says, yeah, because that's, that's what he's telling me. Yeah, he's your brother. So we think that's what's going on. So we have, we'd like to have somebody come through and take all the videos like that and put them into a nice little video of him looking down at the screen, but I haven't done that yet. So a couple other things we did during the pandemic, again with Operation Lemon Meringue idea, is we went to several of his Zoom events, uh, Zoom events, I'm sorry, and he had these um, different psychics, grief vampires that came in with him as well. And when I say psychic, I'm not exactly talking about the psychic, you know, the, on the street corner. I'm talking about mediums. Mediums claim that they can communicate with dead people, right? So when I say psychic, I'm actually talking about a medium. So here's some of the other people. He had Kim, Kimberly Meredith, who was an intuitive, um, she blinks. She blinks repeatedly like this. And when she blinks, that's her contacting spirit. And she has people stand up so she can see them on the Zoom screen all in front. And she blinks at us like this. <laughs> and I'm not kidding. I'm not exaggerating. And so she looks at him and she'll and she'll identify like health issues you have. Like uh, you gotta get your gallbladder checked. You know. Okay, I'm slightly exaggerating, but not by much. So that's uh, Kimberly Meredith and uh, Suzanne Northrup, which was really hilarious because Mark Edward had done a TV show years ago with Michael Shermer, right? And it, uh, one of the things they looked at was Suzanne Northup, and she was a psychic medium. And uh, so I found that Mark gave me a little DVD with, with his like segment on it, and I uploaded it, and I was looking at it. And then uh, Suzanne Northup had a, a, a Zoom event with Thomas Don, and I transcribed it. And darn it, if she didn't use the same darn thing. I'm getting a rose. There's a rose, something about a garden, and maybe it's somebody's name. Uh, is it a grandmother's name, Rose, or there's roses, like small roses. There's something about roses. And darn it, it was the same thing in Mark's event, too. It is like, how many years? 50, 40 years? 40 years. Oh, it's been a long time between it, you know? And she's still using the same old schlick, you know? It was hilarious. So these are all articles you can read if, you, if you're interested. <laughs> Another thing is, Sea Salt Psychic was a show by Thomas John. Okay? This happened before I... I uh, had in the New York, we were in the New York Times talking about it. So what Thomas John does in Seatbelt Psychic, I think you've seen these shows like Cash Cab or, or Writing with the Comedians or whatever and take go, go to coffee with the whoever. So they're in the car, right? And they're driving along and things happen. Well, that car is covered in cameras. But you, because we're, as, you know, as a society, as we are, we're not thinking. We're thinking, oh, these two people are having an intimate conversation. We're not thinking of all the camera people and the sound people and everything that's there. There are other things happening that we're just not aware of. So what Thomas John does, the show is sold this way. He's the, he's the ride-share driver. And people get in the back seat. And then he drives away from the curb. And he talks to them about the dead person. 
And within a minute or two, they're crying, and, and they're 100% they're spot on. So anyway, that was Seatbelt Psychic. So what we did is we went back and we visited Seatbelt Psychic, and I did this show called Right Turns Only, Circling Back to Seatbelt Psychic. And what we did is we took all of his shows, we turned off the sound, and my team and I, just like in a couple days, we, we looked through the back window. And every time we could see something through the back window of either Thomas John or the person in the back seat, we did a screen, screenshot, right? So what we found is that these people are all being picked up at the same location and dropped off at the same locations. And we also realized they're going in one direction. He's always making right turns. Always. And he's always in the lane closest to this curb. Always. And and we would see things like there's some of the stuff that I have in the article. When you can see him happy, okay, so the camera's on him, he's talking, you can't see the people in the back seat. And then you can see, and then the next shot, there's people in the back seat that are answering him. So what you can do is you can see him talking, he's asking him a question. Through the corner of his window, you can see a highway that has graffiti on it, and you can see exactly where he is at that moment. And then the camera in the, in the show that you can see on YouTube shows the people in the back seat answering him, but now they're sitting in a place, like within a second of him, they're sitting at a stoplight with cars around him and a shopping center behind him. I'm like, wow, that was fast. How did he do that, you know? And, it, and then about a minute or so later, they're answering a different question, and now they're back at that same highway entrance with the graffiti on it, and it's looped around. So he's just going in loops. Right turn. We think it's for insurance reasons that, you know, he, they're riding around. And I did interview a person who was in that back seat. I won't say how, because I don't want the person to be revealed how we found the person. But they were really embarrassed whenever I told them what had gone on. And they're like, I was crying so fast. I don't know what was going on. Bigfoot could have been running alongside the car. I wouldn't have noticed. I was just out. You know, he, he was talking about, about my dad. And, you know, turns out these people, I guess, applied on Craigslist for this game show. They filled out lots of paperwork beforehand. Hot reading. He shows up at the event. They're picked up at the event. They've got a table. You have to sign waivers. So, okay, it's not hard to see how we find this information. So that was in the, uh, also, uh, we talked about the cameras, those giant cameras. Not these little, the Hollywood people are lying to us. <laughs> So, or they say, I, I couldn't get it. One woman told me the other day, she says, because uh, people write to me all the time, she says, I kind of got that there would be cameras all around the car, but I just thought, well, but he still has to be real. I mean, my gosh. So, wait, these, some of these photos you can see, I don't know how well you can see over here, this is no hope. Three different, he's wearing three different outfits, three different days, there's three different, uh, he's going the same, passing this place, it's something in North Hollywood. It's a movie theater, and like, and you could just see it out of his driver's side window. So you know he's going on a loop as we're recording the show. This is another picture where they, we could see the giant hospital, Kaiser Hospital in Hollywood, and we kept seeing it in the background as he looped around with different people in it. So I mean, nobody's going to be just darn bored enough, except during a pandemic, I guess, in my group. But we did this. It was a hard job. It was so tedious. But we had to turn off the audio so that we could really concentrate on what was going on there. We had lots and lots of images. And then we could have mapped it out on the rope where we, he was going. It's very, very interesting. So I'm pausing for just a second. My check, chance to make sure that I'm okay on time. I'll mention this quickly. This is a New Zealand um, psychic. Uh, she's a...